portions in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice would you stand with us as we sing Hold our God seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore so glad you're here with us this morning at Broadway Baptist Church. It is a good day to be here and to be, to get, be in this place and worship the Lord our God and just love singing that song with you as one great choir lifting up our Savior. Before we sing this next song as they play along behind me, we're going to read our scripture today. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. God's word said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. By the power of the Holy Spirit, they did these things. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What excites me about that portion of scripture is they were able to do remarkably amazing things by the power of the Holy Spirit. People who never had anything in common before Jesus Christ came into their lives, before they were filled with the Holy Spirit, were gathering together people who would have been at war with each other before Christ. When he came into their lives, it changed everything. And they were as one, and they turned the world upside down with the apostles' doctrine. They did great things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because who they were, but because of who they served. So as we sing this song, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. The early church needed Jesus Christ. They needed the power of his Holy Spirit, and we do as well. We live in a wicked, sinful day, but we serve a wonderful Savior who can empower us to do great and mighty things for his name. Let's sing this together. Lord, I need you. Temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you, Jesus. You're my hope and stay.
And while the worship team continues to play, let's get around and shake hands and fellowship with each other. Greet our visitors this morning. Make them feel welcome. Shall you 
Father, we thank you that we can use the breath that you have given us to sing praise to your worthy, holy name. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that ministers to us even now as we sung these songs of worship. Lord, they lift us into heavenly places. We think of the day when we shall all be gathered around the throne and we will sing, Behold our God. We will worship you praise you for all eternity. Thank you for the opportunity we have to do it here and now in this place. Father, I pray that you'd be with Brother Kevin as he comes to bring us your word, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to us. And Lord, I pray that when we leave this place today, we'll say that it's been good to be in this place together. Father, I pray for all the ministries of this church going on right now, the nursery, the children's church, everything that is ministering to your people. And I pray that we would not be the same after this service is over. Lord, we'd be more like you. We thank you and praise you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And amen. All right, you may be seated. Children's church, you're dismissed right back there to that back door. I pray y'all have a wonderful time learning about the Savior. This morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you with us this morning. If you are visiting with us today, we are so glad to welcome you. And hopefully we're going to get some lights on where I can see you. There they go. Now, good morning. Good morning. I thought I was speaking to an empty building there for a second ago. Couldn't see anybody, couldn't hear anybody. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we are so delighted to welcome you. Out of all the places you could be on a Sunday morning, you have chosen to be here, and that thrills our heart. Welcome to our service today. I uh, pray that you have just been right at home with us as we've worshiped through music, and now we're going to look at the Word of God. Hopefully you have a listening guide in your hand. Uh, they're inside the bulletin, and hopefully you have one there you can follow along with us. You may remember last Sunday morning, we talked about after the resurrection. And in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says that the, the apostles were with, with Jesus. And I noticed this week, as I look back over this passage, they kept on asking him. Wasn't that they just asked him, uh, are you at this time going to restore Israel and restore the kingdom? But they kept on asking him. Acts, uh, Acts doesn't tell us how many times they did ask him, but it was more than one time. And finally, the Bible says that Jesus simply said, the Father sets those times, and they are not for you to know. If they kept asking him, and he said, look, you're not going to know that. Matter of fact, back in the Gospels, the Bible tells us that even Jesus himself doesn't know when that day is going to come. And why he's just going to be sitting there at the right hand of the Father, and Jesus, God's going to look over at him and say, okay, it's time. Go get my church. And Jesus is going to come again and receive us unto himself. Well, in Acts chapter 2, uh, well, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, the time is not for you to know. But then he says, one thing that you need to know is when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and you'll tell people about me everywhere. Would you say the word everywhere? Everywhere. Do you realize at every single day, regardless of where you are, you are somewhere. And around you are people who need to hear what Jesus has done in your life. 
You need to be open and honest telling people what Jesus has done for you. If Jesus has changed your life in any way, he has given you something to share. If he has set you free from sin, he has given you something to share. And you need to be telling people everywhere. Jesus goes on to say in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. Folks, we're on the other end of the earth from where Jesus actually spoke these words. But we need to be telling people everywhere what Jesus has done for us. If Jesus has made some improvements in your life, you need to tell people. If Jesus has made some corrections in your life, you need to be willing to tell people. I know we don't need more witness training, but folks, you already know everything you need to know to help people find Jesus. If he has found you, and if you've responded by uh, the invitation to put your trust in him, then uh, you have something you can share with other people. Today we're going to be looking at the power of the Spirit, Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading with verse number 1. The Bible says, When the day of Pentecost came, and all were together in one place, suddenly the sound, of a blow, the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each other. Uh, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, many of you have heard of charismatic groups that speak in an unknown tongue. Uh, you're going to see in this passage, that's not what it's talking about. But uh, look at verse number 5. And they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, from every nation under heaven. Would you say the two words, every nation? Every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men speaking Galilean? Are all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Now, these folks are Galilean people. And yet, how is it we hear them speaking our own language? Verse number 7, utterly amazed. They asked the question, aren't these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us can hear in our own native language? Now, last summer at our annual Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention made some decision, and even to this day, there are people who will tell me that they just really didn't like the decisions that were made. Well, I'm here to tell you, Southern Baptists are not a perfect people. They're not. And Broadway Baptist Church is not a perfect church. But we're doing the best we can to get the message of God out to the world. Even as we gather here this morning, there are over 3,500 missionaries around the world that are sharing the gospel with other people. Now, that's not as, uh, don't get the wrong picture. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to go with my friend Jeff Redmond to Ethiopia. And I kind of wondered now, what are we going to be like when we gather for worship on a Sunday morning? I had no idea what to anticipate. But there were two missionaries, the missionary and his wife, and me and Jeff, and we met for a church service. Now, I don't know what I had in mind, but it wasn't four people gathering to worship. And I've come to realize, actually just thought about it, and, uh, you know, if we had not been there, uh, there would have only been two people gathered for worship that Sunday morning. Uh, in the early service, Justin talked about when the uh, virus first came into America, they had to close their church down, but he and his family met together, and he talked about their singing, and uh, one song they sang every Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, here they are, just five people worshiping the Lord together. Well, in Ethiopia, those missionaries, there were just two of them gathered to worship God. So I don't know what you think about when you think about missionaries worshiping, but when they gather to worship on a Sunday morning, sometimes it's not a big crowd. A lot of the work they do is through the week as they work with various missionaries. Matter of fact, the group that had gathered for 
us to do some teaching to. Uh, you know, you've heard of the A-list people that have trusted Christ and have grown some. Uh, we didn't have the A-list. Matter of fact, we didn't even have the B team uh, that was gathered. Uh, one of the little girls that sat and listened to us sat. She wasn't quite facing the wall, but uh, her desk was turned toward the wall a little bit, and she, as best she could, tried to face the wall the whole time we were teaching. And uh, it was a very interesting week, a very gratifying week as we taught the Word of God to these people. But I don't know what you think missionaries go through, uh, but sometimes it's not the most flattering work in the world, but it's a very heartwarming work that they do as they see people whose lives are changed for eternity because of the work they are doing every single day. So you have missionaries this morning, over 3,500 that are in various parts of the world sharing the gospel with people. So uh, Southern Baptists are not a perfect people, but we're doing the best we can to get the message of the gospel out in the world. Verse number eight, they were concerned. How is it we hear these Galileans speaking, but they're speaking our language? In verse number nine, it gives you a list of all the nations that are there. And it's somewhere between 15 or 20, depending on what version of the scripture you're looking at and how they interpret some of the places. Uh, You have all kind of numbers of people that are there. But somewhere between 15 and 20 various nations of people have come together to hear the word of God. Look at the end of verse number 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, and they said, they've had too much wine. Now, many of you are hesitant to share your gospel, your story with other people. And that's the reason why. Because there are people out there that will make fun of you. There are people out there that will make it hard for you, make it difficult for you. We call that persecution. Let me tell you, in parts of the world, the persecution that Christians are going through is much, much different, much, much worse than you and I go through than just having someone make fun of us. But I want to tell you, they were faithful to be used by God to let his spirit speak through them. Verse number 14, then Peter stood up with the 11. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you, listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. You can find what's happening here on the pages of the Old Testament. And then he begins to explain to them what's taking place, and he uses the prophet Joel. Notice what Joel had said. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below, and blood and fire will billow with billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Look at verse 21 again. Everyone, did you say the word everyone? Everyone. Not just a few, not just those who are attending church, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I don't know what you've heard about trusting Christ as your Savior and Lord. But it really is just that simple. If you'll call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. A lot of people like to add to that and say, you got to do this, you got to do the other, you have to have done this, and you have to have done the other. And they just make all kinds of issues 
come up that hinder people from putting their trust in the Lord. But you read there, verse 21, it really is that simple. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't know where you're from or what your life is like, but if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, I need to say to you very plainly that if you will call on the name of the Lord, he will save you. He just wants you to put your trust in him. And the Bible says not only will he save you, but he will forgive you of your sin and he will bring you into the family of God. It's just that simple. And I don't know why anyone would put that off. I don't know why anyone would make fun of that. But folks, you can be saved here in this place today if you will simply call on the name of the Lord. The Bible makes it plain. It's not complicated. It's not hard. And it's no different here than it is in any part of the world. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It'd be our prayer this morning that if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, that today would be the day that you'd open your heart and you'd call on the name of the Lord and you would leave this place today an individual that has been saved by God. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you uh, through him, as you know yourself. This man was handed over to you by God's purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You and I are responsible for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was for our sin that he died. Now all you have to do is put your trust in him, call on him, and he will save you. But we have to realize it was our sin that, was, that brought about his death. With the help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But look at the next two words. But God. Jesus died on a cruel cross. But God, he wasn't finished. I want to tell you, it doesn't make any difference what we do here on this earth. Our God is a sovereign God. He's always going to work things out in his way, and he's always going to have the final word. We are the reason Jesus was put to death, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep him. In it, it, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Folks, you and I are responsible for the death of Lord Jesus Christ. But God raised him to death. And as you call upon him, not only does he forgive you of your sin, but he brings newness of life. And he puts inside of you so that you can use that life now to bring glory to God in the things that we do. We are responsible for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But... God raised him to life, gave him new life so that through him he could give newness of life to each and every one of us. Folks, if you're here today, you've never put your trust in Christ. I want you to know God wants to raise Jesus up in your life. He wants to bring this newness of life into your heart and your life. He promises he'll forgive you of your sin. He'll bring us in to his dear family. On Wednesday nights, we've been working our way through the book of Romans. This past Wednesday night, we went through Romans chapter 8. I don't have the whole chapter there. It's a wonderful chapter. I would encourage you to read that chapter. But look at these verses, if you would, here in Romans chapter 8. Now, before we get started, Paul talks about living by your sinful nature or living by the Spirit. And he really doesn't give us a middle ground. You're either living by the sinful nature or you're living by the Spirit. 
we like to talk about the middle ground. No, I'm not quite living by the Spirit, but I'm not full of the Spirit. I mean, I'm not quite living by the sinful nature, but I'm not full of the Spirit either. Somehow we think there is a middle ground. Paul doesn't give us that option. He tells us we're living by the sinful nature or we're living by the Spirit. Look, if you would, Romans chapter 8, verse number 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the sinful nature desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. I would ask you just to evaluate the days of the last week. How many days did you see the sinful nature at work in your life? How many days did you see the Spirit of God at work in your life? Those who live by the sinful nature do what the sinful nature desires. Those who live by the Spirit do what the Spirit desires. Look, you would at verse number 6. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. God not only wants to bring life into your life, but he also wants to bring peace into your life. I would be interested to know how many people sitting in this building right now really would love to see peace reigning in their life, peace in their family, peace on their job, peace just enter in the individual life that we live. Look at verse number 7. The mind of sinful man is hostile to God. It does not to submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The mind controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Look at verse number 8 again. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot. Say the word cannot. cannot. You cannot. You cannot please God. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God. Or if the Spirit of God lives in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to Christ. My question for you this morning is, as you look at your life, have you trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord? The moment you trusted Christ... The Holy Spirit of God came into your life, and he wants to control your life. He wants to bring life and peace. Look at verse number 10. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Folks, I want to tell you, it is amazing what we see when the spirit of God is controlling an individual, doing far more than we ever imagined he could do through someone like us. But it's because of him. And it's because not of what we are doing, but because of what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. And folks, God wants to live in you. He wants the Holy Spirit to have control over your life. And if you'll yield yourself to him, God wants to do great things through you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for every person that's in this building this morning. And Father, I just pray that you'll help us to really Take a deep look in our own heart. And if there are those here this morning that have never trusted Christ as their Savior and Lord, I pray today you'll help them to open their heart and receive him, knowing they'll have their sins forgiven, knowing that he will bring us into the family of God. Father, I pray for Christians here today, and I pray that we will desire every day to yield ourselves to the work of your Holy Spirit and that you'll guide us and uh, strengthen us, empower us, and use us for your glory. We pray these things this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, this morning, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, I pray today you'll open your heart and put your faith in him. He promises he'll forgive you of your sin. He'll bring you into the family of God. 
But you need to open your heart and receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. We're going to stand together and sing. And it's our way of giving you an opportunity to respond as God is speaking to your heart. You come this morning. I'll meet you right here at the front.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Logan's coming with some announcements, and then Chase Parker's coming with a very special announcement for our men. Amen. Amen. If you haven't picked up a bulletin, please do so as you exit this morning. A lot of really important information in the bulletin. Um, starting off with the save the dates, do not forget next Sunday night is one of the biggest nights of the year for our student ministry is our annual cake pie auction for um, our fundraiser for camp. Um, and uh, we're looking, we got a lot of kids going to camp this year, so we're really needing um, some cakes to be donated, some pies to be donated, and for, for you guys mainly to be there um, so we can um, hopefully send our kids to camp. Um, that, this auction's been so good, our student ministry over the past couple of years. Um, last year, I think we raised a little bit over $12,000, um, and we're looking to do just that again this year um, with that. Again, it's going to be extremely fun. Going to be some competition that you're actually going to be able to be part of. Uh, I'll let you know next Sunday night what that is. Um, but hey, there's some sign-up sheets back there. We've kind of dropped the ball on putting these little sign-up sheets in the bulletin like we normally do. That's my fault. Casey mentioned it to me last week, and I completely forgot about it. Um, but they're on the back table. So if you're somebody who would say, hey, I'd love to donate a cake or a pie or some cookies or something else um, to that auction, grab one of those. And if you already know what you're going to, to donate, just drop it back on the back side of that table so I can pick those up today. If you don't know, that's okay, too. You can bring those back and hand those to me as late as, um, as next Sunday morning with your dessert. I will make sure to have the bottom door unlocked as well if you just want to bring your dessert next Sunday morning um, and put it downstairs so we can go ahead and get those labeled and ready to rock and roll for the cake pie auction. Cool. Also, if you have not registered or signed up to help with VBS, please do so over here at this side table. Miss Megan would greatly appreciate that. Um, the Merrymakers, they're going to be going to Papa Doobie's this Thursday. They'll be meeting at the church at 10 a.m. They're leaving by 10, 15. Um, Coach Parker will be up here in just a second as he makes his way on up to talk about the Real Men Conference. Uh, but also, don't forget, we're having a new church directory um, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So there'll be some more information about that soon. Um, don't forget our needs for the food closet, cans of green beans, our Operation Christmas Child, Hot Wheel sized cars, um, and matchbox sized cars, all of that good stuff. Um, last but not least, the Stella Patton Group will be meeting tomorrow, April 15th at 6 p.m. in the New Fellowship Hall. So if you're part of that, make note of that. Other than that, I'm going to ask Coach Parker to come back up. He's going to talk to you about Man Church. I'll come back up and pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Good morning. I uh, turned 40 last month, and... Uh, Went out to eat with one of my buddies Friday night, and uh, I said, do you cry more now? <laughs> and uh, he started laughing. He said, all the time. And first service, I got up here and boo-hooed like a baby. So <clears throat> I'm going to try not to do that this time. Uh, what is Man Church? Uh, we got a D-Life group uh, that we started. Uh, Irby, he contacted me and Philip, uh, Will Kirk, Ashley Spagner. And the four of us started meeting, and it was a 52-week commitment. And I was like, there's no way I can do this. Uh, never done a just a man's Bible study, small group, but we done it. And today's message kind of hit home because when we were not meeting versus <clears throat> when we did meet, I'm a piece of crap. <clears throat> and... When I don't go to Bible study, it's a direct reflection of the piece of crap I am. Uh, and this is a good thing. Uh, this will be the third version of this that we've done. Uh, we tried out a small five-week video study. It was great. Uh, then we just finished uh, a book study by the same group. And now we've got 15 to 20 guys coming from that original four. So I know it works. Uh, I don't like to read. What we're going to be doing is a video series. So it'll be a 15 minute video. And it's a 40 week commitment. We got sign ups back there in the back. Uh, when you sign up, as you put your name down, choose which day works best for you. I got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Hopefully, this thing is going to be multiple groups meeting, whatever night fits your schedule is the goal. Uh, so will you click to the next slide for me, please? It'll show you the um, 
this is their strategy. So they recommend having quarterly large group meetings where all the men in the Bible study groups come together, and that's what we're going to do on uh, April 24th. So March the 10th, Nazareth hosted a uh, man church conference, and Rick Burgess came and spoke. So on the 24th, what we're going to do is we're going to watch that video. We'll have food that night starting at 530. Uh, we'll eat. And then at 6 o'clock, we'll start the video up here. We're going to eat downstairs. Uh, and then following that, we'll break up into the small groups, and we'll have uh, eight five-week video sessions that we meet and watch and uh, do a Bible study that go along with it. So why do we need man church? Well, in that D-Life group, it just kept coming up, kept coming up. Uh, I see it every day at school. You see it on the news. Uh, everybody gripes about how bad our country is, but what are we doing to fix it? And if the, if the man ain't leading it, it ain't gonna happen. So this is a excerpt from that. It says, uh, there's a discipleship problem affecting Christian men today. Too often men are absent from both the church and from the vital work the church is doing in the world. These men are not engaged spiritually in their homes and they ain't making a kingdom impact in the workplace. And it all points back to one major issue. Many men are not being uh, discipled, but when men are being discipled, powerful things happen. As a result, they'll impact their church, their family, <clears throat> and their culture. You go to the next one, please. So this is just some highlights. We talked in our group. Uh, I told everybody, I said, y'all choose just a little snippet from the man church video that stood out to you. So <clears throat> these are just two videos. You can play them whenever you get ready, Austin. We had technical difficulties this morning. They didn't work, so hopefully it'll work. Who's over there? That's a God-fearing man. Now, what did that mean? That meant in one statement that we were to know that man had wisdom because he had enough wisdom to fear Almighty God and live his life accordingly. Do we even adhere to that? Anybody even trying that anymore? Any young people ever heard God-fearing man? I don't even hear it anymore. Anybody even care about that? Is it anybody's goal to be a God-fearing man? Do you ever tell your kids about God-fearing man? How about this? Do your kids and grandkids think you're a God-fearing man? I could ask them. What do you think they'd say? What if I went to your kids or your grandkids and I said, tell me the most God-fearing man you know? Would they say you? Got quiet, didn't it? Who's over there? That's a God-fearing man. It's all on that one. Now, what did that mean? Who's over there? That's a God-fearing man. Now, what did that mean? That meant in one statement that we story. were to know that man had wisdom. It may have just uploaded the same one, Austin. All right, we can go back to the final slide that's got the dates on it. So... It's gonna step on your toes. Every video session we did, uh, it'll hit you right in the face. And that's what men need, that's what I need. Uh, I need God on constantly. And <clears throat> this, this stuff will do it. Uh, so 5.30 on the 24th, we will have, I just put burgers, but we're gonna do hot dogs too. Uh, we're gonna try to feed everybody from the youth down to the little kids that night. Uh, and then six o'clock we'll watch the recorded message of Rick, uh, Randy Sims is going to get up and close us in prayer that night and share a little bit. Uh, so we should be done by 7.30 uh, on the 24th. So I hope everybody got a little bit of interest, and uh, we hope to see you there. Sign-up sheets are in the back. Wives, elbow your husband. Get them up here. Yes, uh, whatever night works best for you, don't forget to mark that on the uh, sign-up. Amen. You can go see the guys back at the table as well if you have any other questions or go see Chase. Let me pray and you guys will be dismissed. Father, you're good. You're holy. Thank you so much for all you've done, for what you're doing in the life of our church. Thank you that we can gather in a space and worship you. 
We can hear your word. We can talk about you. And Father, we can encourage others to follow you more. Father, I pray that you would just be with us as we go throughout all of what's coming up in our church. That we would seek to glorify you in all of it. That, Father, that you would provide, that you would help grow us the better followers of you. We thank you so much for everything you've done and everything you're going to do. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, before you're dismissed, would you help me stack the chairs, please? Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah.